playing guitar is something I was always driven to do as a young kid. Now, some of my first days and some of my first musical influences came from listening to to the radios in the morning before school and some of the musical specials that were on TV. I specifically remember uh, one time watching TV here in Rhinestone Cowboy by Glenn Campbell for the first time. And as you know, he passed away not that too long ago. But it brought up this memory and playing guitar and kind of leads me into my next guest. Well, that night I listened to Rhinestone Cowboy. I grabbed my my wiffle ball bat from my bedroom and a couple of old shoe strings and tied them onto the wiffle ball bat. And if you know anything about the wiffle ball bat, it's fat at one end and at the other end it's kind of got some uh, markings on it, kind of resembles frets. And I would get in the mirror and I would sing the song and I would pretend I was playing guitar. You know, that basically that was my first, some of my first experiences as playing a guitar was just strumming a wiffle ball bat. Now, luckily, years later, I had a kind uncle that loaned me my first guitar and an amp that I was able to take home and start practicing on and start cutting my teeth with. From there on, uh, history wrote itself. I got me a, a job, bought me another guitar, and moved on from there. But playing guitar has given me an opportunity to touch people a lot of times I normally wouldn't either with playing music or sharing music or things between them and sometimes just sharing your time with the next musician and the next musician that's on the show today is Seth Freeman he leads the Seth Freeman band and he's dedicated most of his life um, to being a musician a guitar player playing the dobro and um, if you guys are lucky enough you'll be able to see him in concert or one of his shows he tours throughout the u.s up in alaska and some different places and i had the pleasure of meeting him he's from around my way and i've met him a few times sometimes he would come to town and play and i would make sure i made it up there to at least uh, show some support at the venue i may have been working and not able to attend but at least i uh, talked to him either before the show or after the show and uh he would lend me a CD, let me listen to some of his songs, and and vice versa. We got a chance to talk for a few minutes. But today is the first time I got a chance to sit down and talk to him at length. And uh, it's a great interview. So I want to welcome you guys to the interview with Seth Freeman. Uh, this is episode six of Mega Talks. All right, I'm CT. I'm live on the air here with um, Seth Freeman and doing this for the Mega Talks podcast. How's it going today, Seth? I know you just woke up. Yeah, doing pretty good, man. Cool. Just enjoying being at home for a day. Oh, yeah, busy tour? Yeah, it's just kind of endless in the summer. It's, in the winter, it's more like runs on a bus or, or something. But in the summer, I'm just like home a day, gone three gone a week home two days or whatever it's flying a lot going to festivals so oh i bet is it um you know you come a long ways from when i first met you i met you back in darnell you know playing in the down on front street and you know seeing you rehearse down there on front street listening to you always you know being a fan of your guitar playing your style and your um no just your drive to go out there and get it and you know it's not something that a lot of people stick to they give up but you're right. special. You didn't give up. You're you're kept on doing what you're doing and having fun doing it. Um, you want to talk a little bit how you got started? Yeah, well, I mean, really, it's just a family legacy. I mean, it's like uh, my grandpa played guitar and my dad played guitar, and then both my grandpa and my dad's families on my dad's side play an instrument. So it's like guitar is more like for my grandpa and my dad, but the whole family played piano or sang or played upright bass or played violin or, or dobro or something. Nice. And the ones that didn't 
which was very few, they sang so well you could tell that their instrument. Mm -hmm. So I just grew up submerged in it. And honestly, I was 10 years old, I guess, when my mother and my stepdad moved to Maryland. And I started going to a different school and a different place and meeting different cultures and families in general that I actually realized that I had something. Mm -hmm. Before then, I kind of hated it, honestly, because oh, yeah. they were so good and they were strict about it and they were demanding. <laughs> so so it was um, it was almost a chore for most of my life uh, up until about 10. Mm -hmm. And then when I moved away to a different state, I got to listen to what I wanted to and I met a few other kids that played a little bit and started figuring out what music I liked and what I wanted to play instead of just being my family's student, just, basically. It's kind of influenced by them. Uh, did the blues, right. was the blues kind of your pick or was it something that you, you know, you just it had was, a year uh, for? Well, the blues kind of, so, so my, my, up until about, I don't know the exact age, but I was born in 84, so in 90 or 91, I would have been six or seven. Mm -hmm. It must have been like 92 when Stevie Ray had died in, in late 90. And yeah. then like the following year, the Stevie Ray Vaughn strat come out and so did The Sky is Crying, that album. Mm -hmm. And like right at the same time, I started going up to Gary Ragland's. He had this hog farm up on the mountain and he had a, a jam building, a jam house, you know. Oh, yeah. That's nice. With a full of gear, and my dad was taking me up there. And he picked me up from my mother's one day, and, and he bought that album, The Sky is Crying, and we listened to it on repeat all oh, yeah. the way up to Whit <laughs> Springs. And, uh, of course, that album had a, a Jimi Hendrix cover on it, too, so that was my introduction to, to black music oh, in yeah. general and blues as well as Jimi hendrix and uh and then when i got to uh gary's that night after listening to that all day there was a stevie ray vaughn one of those artists signature series strats and he had one of the first year ones Dude. and uh so like all in one big day i seen all that and then that night watched my dad and all them jam and it was a whole lot of blues they were playing mm -hmm. so that was pretty much my introduction to blues originally was gary raglan mm -hmm. i called him my musical godfather for a long time because he just turned me loose with guitars and, and boxes full of cds or whatever now, now that day that y'all jammed um and listened to the cd did you uh sit in with the band were you playing or were you just observing at that point, I was a little intimidated, and I did play, but not with them, mm -hmm. and not like at the beginning of the night. It was more later on, you know, uh, Gary and, and Dennis was, uh, I think they were impressed with my patience and oh, yeah. my focus as a kid. I just sat there for four or five, six hours and watched them jam and stayed <laughs> in one place and just was paying attention, so then they started handed me guitars when they kind of winded down and i played for them by myself uh -huh. but no it was a, it was still a bit longer before i started feeling secure to, to jam in front of gary now now what was your playing style and this is getting a little you know technical on guitar were you um were you like a standard tuning like an e or were you standard like down a half step e flat or yeah well um so in the beginning it was all gospel and bluegrass and in like old country. So it was all in standard. And hmm. I played with my grandpa a lot. He, he'd play like acoustic rhythms for me, mm -hmm. for me to play like melody lines and vocal lines and lead lines. And he's who really kind of worked with me in the beginning. He's like, he's the one that put in the time and, and, and showed me, this is that chord, and, and this is how you do that. And he had an old four track reel to reel. Oh, nice! He recorded me. So, my first recordings was with my grandpa, with him playing. Uh -huh. And uh, and then as time went on, 
you know, I started jamming with other people and getting away. And then every other weekend, on average, is when I'd go to my dad's side of the family. And uh, my dad would take me up to Gary, so I started getting to jam some blues. Mm-hmm. And and I would take back whatever I borrowed from Gary then and, and change it out for more. That was kind of my lifelong oh, yeah. thing with him. I'd just go uh, get a box full of, al- of albums and, and take them home and I'd copy them or huh. listen to them or do whatever I did and, and take them back and get more. So mm-hmm. so as, as my collection started getting more impressive, I started getting more into just other styles but always rooted out of blues is really what i found that connected to and uh it wasn't until i was probably in my mid to late teens when my grandpa bought me a lap still and that was when i first got into open tunings oh man now you did have a um i have one of your cds now the the song for katie yeah is that one you played lap still yeah, that's a it's a dobro, but yeah, oh, okay. I actually ended up recutting that song. Oh, uh, you did? I changed a little bit of the lyrics and uh, just added like drums and an upright and a, and, a, and my buddy played slide too, the exact licks I am in harmony. Uh-huh. And, uh huh. And he favorites. also sang <laughs> harmony. Yeah, man, if you've not heard that that newer version, like the version you're talking about, was right when I wrote it. I mm-hmm. needed an extra song for that demo. And, but yeah, I re-released that uh, in this, oh, oh, 2013, actually. Just oh, trying sure. to remember. Yeah. Yeah, so so that's my... Uh, it's on Spotify radio, oh, yes, okay. and it's on YouTube and, and everything. And, and I may have it's heard it It's just self-titled album. But, I, you know, when I heard it, I may have actually thought it was, you know, I had the wrong song or something like that. Because I remember uh, seeing you down on Front Street and um, talking to you, and you, you know, you loaned me the CD, so to speak. And I yeah, said, is it? I is it that. a Seth Freeman band, the Whirlwinds album? Is that the one you get? I think so. It's like a dark yeah. gray cover or something. Yeah, so that's uh, that's actually like my demo. Yeah. I don't even sell that album or, or like talk about that album really for the reason being, it was a demo. Only half of it's mine. The mm-hmm. other half was Chris Gully's. Oh yeah. And then I, of the of two songs that were mine, one of them went on my last album i redid it okay. and then one of my dad's songs went on his album hmm. and two of the chris gully songs went on his album so that song, that album got dispersed to other albums and recut better basically mm-hmm. that was just something used for booking at that time oh, when okay. i handed it to you now when the um the song for Katie, can you go into like detail about it? You know, the how that song come about, or maybe the inspiration for that song. Yeah, it was uh, my girlfriend at the time, uh, Katie Spencer. She was living in Russellville, and I was always coming and going playing. So when I was around, I'd stay with her, honestly, and uh. She went to her family's on like an off night for a Christmas. It wasn't actually Christmas. It was before or after. I can't quite remember now. It's been almost 10 years ago. Mm-hmm. But uh, but nonetheless, I was going to stay at her house by myself that night. And uh, she had something I wanted. I don't remember. She had some food she made or something. And, and the deal was if I stayed there and ate her food i had mm. to write her a song <laughs> oh yeah <laughs> That's so cool. <laughs> so i did and uh basically it just kind of was put in my pocket some songs it seems like i have to work harder at and then some songs that just kind of just roll them off. like somebody told them to me yeah yeah and that was one of them i i, I had to do it for the bargain and uh, i did it and well, gotta... She come back the next day thinking that I didn't do it. She was oh, kind of yeah? joking, <laughs> but I actually wrote her the song. Well, you got a really good song out of it, because I mean, when I first listened to it, it's like it's real easy, it's free flowing. It felt like it just, you know, like you said, just kind of come off the the fingers and come off the, you know, the lips. And I, you know, yeah. it's one of those that I'll put on repeat and just, you know, play it from beginning to end and repeat it in the car. 
Yeah, it's really uh, it's kind of different writing than it's like. It's not a lot of chops involved. It's not real technical. It's just I really kind of went for pretty and flowing and just kind of like more of a vibe mm -hmm. than anything technical or thought out. Yeah, it's just completely like a. It spawned from like when I'm by myself. A lot of people do or play different by oh, themselves. Yeah. And I definitely do. Uh -huh. Like, uh, I don't even play songs, really. I tend to play slide on my lap. Oh, yeah? And I tend to, like, I don't know, out, out of lack of better words, I'm going to call it uh, the soundtrack of my life hmm. is what I play. I can definitely like, relate to that. <laughs> yeah, like like the whatever I'm feeling at the time. Uh-huh. And uh, like I said, it's not a song, and it don't really start and stop, or it may start and stop, but it's just, uh, just thoughts come straight from the heart on the instrument, exactly. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I I tend to like it, try to calm myself down with a, a Weizenborn or a Dobro when I'm at home and I'm off and I'm <laughs> not around people. Mm -hmm. I will play that kind of thing to just like put myself at ease i guess is what i'm doing i've never really thought about it like this but yeah but nonetheless that was like one of them vibes that i create by myself and that time i did it for her thinking of her mm -hmm. and then uh i had a you know that was like the beginning of camera phones so oh, i'd uh yeah. the way i write a lot is i'll put a camera phone down and capture an idea oh really and then I'll have it with me all the time. And uh, uh -huh. that'll free me up to, to press play and listen to it. And I can then have my hands free with a pen and paper now, see, so that I can, like, blossom ideas. Yeah, see, that's something I've always, you know, said I would do if I had a recorder. And I've, you know, got recorders and videos now, and I don't ever do it. I'll tend to jam right. a riff. And if I come back, you know, like a day or two and I'm jamming the same riff, you know, I'll remember it, and I'll think, well, that must be a good riff if I can remember it. But if I don't right. remember them, I'm like, nah, it's probably not any good. But I've lost some, lost some good music like that. I used to think like the that. same thing. But <laughs> the, the truth is, you can't always remember, you know? Yeah. And, uh, like, stuff comes to me in a lot of forms. Like, I might get a drum beat in my head, or I might get a bass line in my head, or it might be a slide part, or it might be a chordal passage for guitar mm -hmm. sometimes it's just straight lyrics and, oh, yeah. and the phrasing and, and melody that they would be in mm -hmm. and then sometimes when i struggle with lyrics or whatever i can actually get on slide and write myself a vocal line and phrasing with a slide mm -hmm. so i kind of i kind of come at it a lot of ways but the truth is if i don't capture it i'll forget it oh, yeah. and it may be good or not but <laughs> nonetheless i'll forget it uh -huh. but uh so back to the katie thing this was just like i said it was a a deal she made so i did it and then uh so that was about 08 or 09 somewhere in there that i wrote that and then her and i split up i got in that car wreck and all that happened and mm -hmm. a lot of time passed and things changed and then and uh 2012 i started working on my new album and uh is, is that the i got a lot of requests for that yeah no no oh, okay i released the two albums at the same time there's an acoustic and then there's a seth freeman band mm -hmm. or seth freeman it's just called seth freeman is what i was advised to do when i released that okay but uh basically it was like I kept getting people that asked about that song. So I, uh, it was actually a tough song for me because mm, yeah. it, we'd broken up and it was like, I never really sang it live much. Oh, really? Okay. And then it was like a bad memory. Me and her hadn't spoke or whatever. And I met this guy, Rick Nielsen, who is the other guy playing on the new cut that I told you about. And, uh -huh. and he also, one that was the first thing he said. He started jamming with me. He's like, how come you don't do that one song? And <laughs> I pretty much was like, oh, more or less, because 
I hate that thing. Yeah, it's kind of in the <laughs> past know? and moving on. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, but he actually helped me get to a place to work on that song and play that song. And then, ironically enough, right after we cut it, I walked outside in Arkansas one day, and there's Katie Spencer standing at my truck, like wow. waiting on me. Uh-huh. And, uh huh. And we just kind of had this first time to see each other in a long time and it was it was good and healing and uh she That's asked cool. of, of all things she asked about that song or indirectly she's like have you got any new recordings and i said actually i cut that song that i wrote for you way better and so i let her sit and hear it uh-huh. so she cried and uh it was just like after that, I was able to play the song, nonetheless, you know. It's and then like you had I the think, blessing to go ahead and do it again. Right? Yeah, exactly. So at this point, now it's it's actually been healing for other people, or uh, love songs for other people, or it's been a lot of things. There's one lady I'm thinking of who, her husband died, and she kind of, mm. she she relates to him or remembers him or however you word that mm-hmm. through that song. Yeah. So so a song that was really originally a, a bright thing for me turned into something dark and then it returned into something that was light for other people. So that song's been quite the trip. Oh yeah. And that that's something about being a musician just you know you're you're touching other people and you're helping them and uh you know just well, makes the overall experience, you know. Yeah. That that's much what more Rick enjoyable. helped me realize too. He's like it's not really your song anymore, man, you know. <laughs> and I was like, "Damn, you're right." And that's how I was selfish about it, because it was my girlfriend and my song uh-huh. for five years, and it was uh, something I stored away, you know? Yeah. And then Rick helped me turn it into, like, everyone else's song. And Yeah, some of those are it, hard to revisit yeah. when you know the emotion it, that goes into it. Exactly, but but that it helped me. My own song helped me get over her, and then now me, me and Katie, I don't know if we'll ever be together again, but we do talk you know yeah, at least every account. month yeah. every six weeks yeah that's just it it's actually better now than it ever was and mm-hmm. we don't really even see each other we just say hi or keep in touch through social media you know how that makes it easier oh yeah for sure but uh so it ended up it's i'm in a good place with that song and i feel like some other people have oh definitely benefited from it yeah yeah thanks for the help with the words uh-huh. but uh and then that's just, that's just a different song. Like I said, that's a different song for me. It's just different than everything I write. It's a different genre. It's it's a different vibe. It's it's, it's real laid back, and it's a it's just a it's a special song in my list mm-hmm. for many reasons. Yeah. And Rick is who changed the name of it because he thought I was saying something other than I was. And, and when did. I wrote it, we were we were together. So later, uh-huh. that line didn't make sense. Mm-hmm. And what he thought I said was a dream worth living in. And so I changed the name of the song to that. Oh, okay. A, a dream worth living in. Uh-huh. And that's the that's the last line of the chorus. And uh, he come down and he played the harmony on a on another slide instrument. So. Mm-hmm. If you haven't heard that version, you should, man. It's so yeah. much better than the. I'm definitely first gonna one. have to look it up. It's Is just way more produced. I got a I Clyde he- Heberling to play harmonica on it. He was a Pete Anderson's roommate, which Pete Anderson was Dwight Yoakam's guitar player. So it's oh, just like a super killer awesome. <laughs> country harmonica player. Like he's yeah. one of them harmonica players that can just evoke emotion, no matter what you're doing. And I just knew I wanted him on the track. And then you were talking about Half Step. I forgot I did that one in Half Step. Oh, you did? Okay. And uh, he showed up at the studio to record it, and then he didn't have the right harmonica, and I was super bummed. Uh, and and we happened to come up with the harmonica, and his harmonica track on that track literally made me cry when I was in shit. the uh, control room. That's listening awesome to, to have him. somebody like that with you. I know, man. And he come, he come back out, and he's like, was that kind of what you were wanting and and i told him man to be honest no that was that wasn't what i was wanting it was way better you know (laughs) 
Because I was wanting him to like harmonize my dobro lick on uh-huh. the third part, but he said it's not really possible on dobro because it's slide instrument. Yeah, I can get. But I'm playing, the notes and, and the harp. yeah, he said it would have been increments of notes. So, yeah. so he he actually did like a tag and call and response. Like we'd play the lick, oh, and man. then he'd play in the hole. Uh huh. So it, it ended up being as big of a part as mine and Rick's part. So cool. I'm a, I like Dwight Yoakam. He's one of my, you know, I listen to some country, but it's got to be like real country, if you know what I mean. Yeah, it's not, for sure. It's not like pop country. I like Yoakam yeah. and, you know, um, not really the current stuff, but the older things. It's got to be like almost hee-haw kind of type of country. You know, you got to feel it when you hear it. Right, exactly. That's how I am. Yeah. People be surprised at a lot of music I listen to. I just... When people say what kind of music do I like, I just tell them, man, anything that shows talent. Oh, yeah. It, it may be anything if it's coming off yeah. my um, phone or whatever. It'll be an eclectic taste of stuff. I listen to a lot of uh, different instruments, too. I mean, that's where I'm at now mm-hmm. because uh, I just had some conversations with some dudes I look up to, and we all learn how to play from our heroes and influences but there kind of comes a time when you almost have to like stop listening to them for a while because Mm -hmm. if you don't you just sound like a watered down version of all your influence yeah you know yeah you can become kind of (laughs) one-dimensional yeah so i kind of got to that point i felt so in doing so i made the turn to slide Mm -hmm. and started going that route and uh listening to to like black vocalists aretha franklin and and trying to do on an instrument what they're doing with their voice yeah and then i got really into piano in the last few years and organ and just other instruments and i've been playing for carl so the horns Uh have come in to my life and so like now i'm moving to guitar other shit and it's sounding like me instead of sounding like a copy or some something. guitar player that i copied exactly uh-huh. and i think a lot of people when they hear like they hear you or they hear you know whoever their other artist is they still hear the similarities but as a musician when we play we still hear who we listen to not so much exactly ourselves. exactly yeah and when you go back and listen to the tape you're like hmm that don't sound like me but i don't you know if you're not playing an instrument i don't think people understand that I think the more time passes, the more I'm sounding like me. Mm-hmm. And uh, I'm recently writing, and uh, I feel like I went through a almost a five-year like writer's block, which oh, is yeah. a shitty excuse for someone that don't try to write, but that's just the best way to say it. Mm-hmm. But uh, my aunt died about three weeks ago, and she was like, She's my great aunt, actually, but she mm-hmm. was like the force in the family on that side. Oh, okay. After her parents died, yeah. she was like the glue of the family. You know, like holiday events were at her house and so on. So she mm-hmm. was she was that figure in my family. And then, not to mention, she was like to me the ultimate business lady in the family, also. Oh yeah. So she like my work ethics and stuff come from her heavily. Yeah. And and also she was the one who single handedly paid for me to go to guitar lessons every Friday for my oh really childhood. Yeah. So she was a big, huge part of my life to say the least. I didn't know and, you took uh, lessons. Yeah, I did. I I took lessons from my grandpa. I took indirect lessons from my dad. I mm-hmm. took somewhat lessons from my aunt and then i took lessons from jim turner which was jennifer flowers guitar player for like Hmm. six years from five years old on or something Mm -hmm. and then at 18 i took lessons from paul travis for three years and he more like paul's who really evolved me because he kind of analyzed where i was at Mm-hmm. and offered me what i didn't know and he taught me what i did know get and that, he get like that pentatonic box exactly <laughs> exactly yeah so he uh 
he really blossomed me in a lot of ways. And then at the same time, I started touring. So I was able to on stage work out what I was learning from Paul. Mm. So, so I was retaining it to mm-hmm. say the least. <clears throat> and, uh, I don't really remember where I was going with that. Oh, I do. Now. About your aunt. My my great aunt died. Yeah. And uh, so my last couple relationship was pretty intense to say the least. And I was trying to write a song, but I kept feeling like my song was just this super dark, depressing shit. Mm-hmm. So I just walked away from it. And ironically enough, something more dark and depressing, my aunt dying actually gave me the light and motivation to record and finish that song and Mm -hmm. it somehow became way more positive with death which was confusing to me but nonetheless i was just grateful that it happened yeah as far as me being able to finish that song and i did it just enough time to record it and send it to them because i couldn't make it to the funeral so i i I played and sang it for them at the funeral on recording yeah And uh, I wasn't there, but from the feedback I got, it sounded like everybody related to it and was appreciative of it and and got where I was going with it. So so it's another song, kind of like Song for Katie, in a sense that's a little different than my normal writing. And and that song in particular, the new one, which I called it Life Goes On, it's (laughs) uh, it sounds more like my dad than anything I've ever done, Uh too. It's kind of got a country approach to the writing, yet it's a more soulful and like it's I'm a, using more soul chords and stuff than like a, a country okay. artist would. It's more it's like a little a bit more dreamy strum. and princey. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Okay. It's like like to me, Purple Rain. That's country. Yeah. But that's Prince doing it. You know what I mean? Because uh-huh. I was going to so ask I you if the you same like thing. were finger picking or if you're straight, you know, like a strum or something. I'm playing acoustic on the cut that I sent. It's me playing an acoustic track and then me playing an overdub dobro track and then oh, a vocal nice. track. So it's a, it's finger picking acoustic just because I could get a prettier tone on the recording like that. And mm-hmm. then I play dobro and slide. I play with no picks because oh, really? my, whole, my whole method is like muting. Uh-huh. It's not really what I'm playing. It's that I'm muting out everything else so it's really clean. Yeah, it's the silence that makes a song. So I'm a, <laughs> yeah, I'm playing, I'm playing like that on it. So it's no pick in it on that card. I could actually, uh, when we get off the phone, I could send you a, a link to the new version of Song for Katie, which is called A Dream Worth Living In. Oh yeah, for sure. And I could send you this new song I just wrote like two or three weeks ago, mm-hmm. which is called Life Goes On. Very and cool. Uh, so I now, as of this year, I have a studio at my house and uh, ample room to have people over and record. So I'm currently trying to, to write and mm-hmm. develop my new album. And this fall, I got people coming down and I'm also engineering. So I got some protégés. I'm trying to help them get their stuff recorded and out. Uh-oh. That's, that's and cool. in doing so, yeah, I'm training them to engineer on their own stuff so that they can help me as well yeah. with mine now, having so a in studio, helping them i'm getting some help too uh-huh. now having a studio there at your house would you say you were um you were more active or do you think you're a little bit more laid back as far as the re- you know recording everything because some, uh, sometimes i feel like me... days there's you know i just don't want to record this i'm just going to play you know well i created this room that's like just an awesome room to hang out mm-hmm. in for one so it's like it's above my board on the blank wall. I have a projector aimed and it's all connected. I have a, a, a record player in there, literally a vinyl oh, record cool. player. Yeah. I have a <laughs> CD player. I have an iPod dock. I have like literally no matter who showed up with whatever form of music they had yeah, laptops with flash drives. I've got a way that it's all piped in. Nice. And so, I mean, I, I hang out in there and listen to music. I hang out in there and learn songs. Mm-hmm. I hang out in there and watch movies. <laughs> I hang out in there and watch documentaries. I record in there. I write in there. I record to others in there. So I'm like, I just created this room that is 
just a, a joy to be fantasy in. land. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Because that's so kind even of if I'm not getting create. something done, yeah. then I'm enjoying myself in it, and I'm in there. Like, and this house that I'm living in is rather big, so for me to hang out in one room, I obviously like that room, you know. Yeah. So the thing is. I find it hard to record myself with my current setup because it's designed from an engineer standpoint. Mm -hmm. So like I can't be in two rooms at once, for example. Oh, okay. So my drummer buddy that lives not too far from me, I I end up conning him over here to help (laughs) me record and press buttons. Push buttons. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so it's hard to get done things by myself. Now you do you do a lot of live tracking when you uh, record with your band. I, I do. I uh, I have to with my setup. I don't have Pro Tools. I don't have computers. I got oh, an older setup. Real? Yeah, it's all analog oh, and shoot. it's all. So with that being said, I there's not much cheating to be done, anyways. No. So, and I I tend to get good players and I make them play it. Like I just make them play what I want, mm-hmm. and uh, if they can't, then I guess that means I get the next player, basically. Yeah. But uh, now but that's, I, that's I have unique. not had to do that much. Normally, I get the right guy. I got a, a good ear and idea of who I want and mm-hmm. who can do it, and I'll get them. And most of the time, they'll play it in a take or two. Mm-hmm. And uh, so most of my shit I'm capturing was actually played by a human and and it's not computer editing yeah it's a it's a whole different feel especially when you play the song back because a lot of the stuff i've done has just been on a computer so when you perform it live you're pretty disciplined on how you have to play there's no like ad libbing a whole lot you gotta start and end on a certain point and it's you know well dickie betts told me <laughs> he said that uh he said there's nothing wrong with either mm-hmm. but he said, if you want a performance on your recording, then you have to play it. You got to play it live. Yeah. If not, you're, you're working on a different piece of art. You're, you know, you're uh, editing mm-hmm. another piece of art, of art. You're almost like the way an artist would work on something at different times and different places. You're doing that compared to an artist that sat down and sketched something out super fast and was done. Yeah. So it's neither one is wrong, and uh, everybody, yeah, everyone has their opinion. But but the way that Dicky made me think about it, I I took his word on it, and that is, I wanted a, a performance captured in the studio, not a composite built song. Mm-hmm. However, some songs that I write, for example. My last album, I had one I wrote about my wreck. And I've honestly mm-hmm. never performed that song live. Mm-hmm. I wrote it, finished it in the studio, literally in the vocal booth with the mic staring me down, like trying to come up with final lines. Wow. And and cut it. And then I myself played most of the parts. I, I played an electric guitar part. I played a classical guitar part. I played a slide part and uh yeah. that's a lot of layers so I, I yeah so i layered it so you can't do that live you know uh-uh. but most of my tracks i cut in one take so so i'm still kind of getting the live thing even when i'm layering i mm-hmm. try to do that you know you always run into exceptions for everything yeah but well, uh, sometimes i mean you you don't have a choice to go back and feel something because on a recording i mean um, shoot, the sky's the limit on recording. But, you know, I like to record songs, and when you hear them live, I like to have them, you know, a little bit of different sound you want to them. You don't want to hear, some people don't like hearing the same thing again, or maybe they hear, want to hear a little bit of variation. Of what exactly. Done. Yeah, I, uh, I like live recordings for that reason, too, just to hear different takes. And... Now, now, do you video anything in the studio? Well... I'm to that point now, like, for a long time there, I just, I guess, to be honest with you, I'm kind of not that great of a businessman. (laughs) I'm a guitar player. I always mess up when I videotape, though. (laughs) Right, right. So, uh, 
with that being said, I just didn't think like that. I, I should have been videoing. I should have been doing stuff like that. That's actually my downfall to me is my online presence is kind of weak because it's all just a bunch of what I call voyeurism. Some, oh, somebody yeah. in a club with a cell phone that held it up and captured it, and there's people walking in front of the camera. Yeah. So I'm actually to the point in my career that, yes, it's time for me to get some videos, develop my own YouTube channel, get rid of some of these old YouTube videos that ain't helping, and, oh, yeah. and start, like, doing that. And especially with this house that I'm in out here in Washington, it's like the perfect place. To do that, mm -hmm. I just picked up a GoPro, Those and then, of sweet. course, I have an iPhone yeah. as well. So, like, it's time to start capturing my recording tracks, as well as doing, like, video sessions. That's nothing to do with recording, just for, like, YouTube. And... Mm -hmm. So this fall, Carl that I'm playing for, he plays for the Rolling Stones, too. So he's going mm -hmm. to do the Rolling Stones tour mm -hmm. in September and October. I got a three-week run in September, and when I get off, I'm coming here, and I'm just going to get started at recording and writing and developing yeah. my next shit, yeah. which is going to include videos and of just me, acoustic videos of me with the guys, videos of us recording, like uh -huh. maybe even some videos that ain't even me playing. That's just like interview style because yeah. none of that really exists to me. I'm kind of mysterious. Yeah, that's yeah, that's one of the reasons I career. wanted to get you on the interview is because, you know, I hadn't seen that much. You know, every time we talk or something, it's like we got two minutes <laughs> and we're kind of yeah. on to the next. You know, I was always busy. Yeah. You was always busy. I was like, man, we need to just sit down and talk someday or just, you know, do something. Yeah. Yeah. My life's busy for sure. But uh, I like talking about this. And it seems like when I do like talk to you like this, I, I actually learn about myself. Yeah, because you, you uh, verbalize things I've thought or wondered or whatever. But I actually, when you verbalize it and you hear yourself mm -hmm. speak, I you might you probably a little bit like me. You know, when you're by yourself, you you have a lot of thoughts, and when you play guitar, you don't talk. Yeah, I mean, right. Because I that's probably why I do instrumentals because I don't do a whole lot of singing, but I'll play, and then it'll be an emotion. But I won't do any talking. But if I talk to somebody about it. You know, I start to learn about how I was feeling a little bit more, you know, understanding my approach to some things. And I'm sure that's the same as even if you have lyrics, you know, there's may, there's always an underlying meaning, I guess. You know, something that you feel, but you can't really convey to somebody. Exactly. Mm. Yeah, I am. Uh, I was even if I give guitar lessons, which I, I haven't been doing for a while. And if I do, it tends to be like an exclusive lesson. But every time I give a lesson, mm -hmm. I end up teaching myself because you mm -hmm. end up verbalizing things that I never would on my own. Mm -hmm. So you end up learning what you know is really what, what I mean. And it's not that I'm teaching myself, but I'm teaching myself what I know. Yeah. Because you're actually discussing it and it's not just stored in a memory bank. You know, you tend to think about shit differently when it's in a conversation compared to when it's a thought. Mm -hmm. now, now, do you still go up to Alaska? I actually, yeah, I, I don't get to go up there much. I, uh, because of playing for Carl and my band, mm -hmm. but there's not much of a window. Like my tour I was doing up there is extensive. It's it, the longest one I did was like 13,000 miles. Like people don't really understand how big Alaska is. Oh yeah. And That's if huge. you look at a map, that tour that I'm talking about is only like a little scratch of the surface of the total of Alaska. Oh yeah. But, uh, so, so what I'm getting at is it takes quite a while to do the tour that I used to do. So I, I haven't been able to do the extensive tour in all of the places and see everybody that I used to do. Mm -hmm. So it's become more like the bigger gigs or the better paying gigs or my and or my favorite towns, yeah. you know, is what's made the, the tour now uh, or like, the ones that like, of course, the ones that are really hard to get to, they they lost the tour for me simply because the like kodiak island is one of my favorites 
but it's it's either a day ferry ride to get there, which uh-huh. means two days, two days lost to get there and back. Not to mention the ferry only runs like once a week, so I lose oh, a man. week there too. But yeah. that's my favorite place. So sadly, I'm not going to Kodiak, but I'm going uh, August 29th. I fly up there, and I'm doing like three weeks. And I'm jamming and sitting in with some of my friends and bands up there. Cool. And then I am have like 13 or 14 of my own gigs, a couple of them acoustic, the rest of them band. Mm-hmm. And uh, I got a van up there. So I'm. Now, do you have equipment already up there? Do you like, like a, well, like a B rig or that, something? The guy that I leave my van at his house, he's a log home builder. So he has a guest log cabin. And my van sits in front of his house and it's full of. He has a vintage Fender amp collection. So oh, sure. if I want a deluxe, <laughs> I take a deluxe. If I want a Super, I grab a Super. Uh-huh. If I want a Princeton or whatever. So no, you're not burning, I kind of use his place up? for a hub. <laughs> yeah. Because I remember you so burned up an amp one time or something, didn't you? Yeah. Uh, it was actually not my fault, though. It was a, <laughs> it was the Weber voice call. Oh, okay. It was uh, sometimes if a voice call gets out of alignment, it causes a friction thing and it, it caught on fire uh-huh. i seen michael burks running up to the stage i was like damn i guess he wants to jam or something was my <laughs> first thought and then when i looked out of the corner i was like oh shit i could just see the flame <laughs> coming out of my 1967 deluxe reverb uh-huh. still putting out so, sound though wasn't it oh it was it <laughs> sure was so mike it actually sounded incredible yeah and uh mike unplugged it and threw a pitcher of water into the speaker because it was gone at the by the time he made it uh-huh. as soon as that uh grill cloth went it just melted back and when that when that grill cloth hit the speaker then that's when the speaker you know <laughs> but uh so he he threw water on it and it killed it and the, he did good it didn't it didn't actually get any of the electronics he he managed to just put the fire out in a good way oh cool and uh, that amp in particular, I had a buddy in Tel Aviv, Egypt, and he happened to be at that show. He's an American diplomat, and he said, man, you're not going to believe this, but I have a 1971 uh, grill cloth for a deluxe. He said, I've just had it for years and years and years sitting in this cardboard box. Uh-huh. He's like, I'll mail it to you when I get home. So he mailed it to me. So I got a, a a silver face grill cloth on my black face fender. Sweet. So, <laughs> and then I put an EV speaker in there back then. And it barely fits. I had to like turn it and turn it and turn it until it aligned just right around uh-huh. the tubes and the transformer. But uh-huh. so it's a little fire breathing dragon now. It, nice. It's a, uh, it's my favorite little amp. It's my go to amp. Yeah. A 112 Deluxe that's been modified to 6L6s with a solid-state rectifier and an EVL in it. Oh, yeah. And it's it's a, it's incredible. I record sure. with it, and I play live with it. And, mm-hmm. uh, with the exception of if I'm playing for Carl, it's it's a giant band. There's seven of us. Horns and Hammond organs and all this shit. So I've, I switched to a twin reverb with Carl. Oh, okay. But you, with my you, band, I've been using that Deluxe. Do you play it in stereo? Uh, or I guess I have a couple for, for times. No, I I do it whenever like a if I get a shitty amp and it's not got the headroom I'm needing, I'll I'll make them bring another one out and I'll run them both. But like with Carl's band, they're so loud and a twin's loud enough. Oh, okay. So I'm just uh, a slide through a twin's pretty mean. <laughs> so. Not have you ever? I um, tend to play a lot of slide with Carl. That's kind of how I got that gig. Uh-huh. He was a uh, he was using Robert Randolph and Roosevelt Collier. Yeah, I was going to ask you about Randolph. Yeah, because I know he's on he tour was, right now. He was using them, and Robert was doing his own thing, and was just a little too big to where he was missing gigs. So, so he started using Roosevelt, and then Roosevelt, same thing. He had different shit going on, and. So he was using uh, Prince's old guitar player, also from Brown Out and Grupo Fantasma, Beto. Hmm. He was using Beto on the guitar, mm-hmm. and uh, and then he was also subbing in. And on the recordings, he used uh, 
Uh, I'm blanking on his name right now. He's a Swedish guy that's been living in New Orleans. Uh, Anders Osborne. Hmm. So he was using two guitar players, one of them a slide player, and then he was using two steel players. So wow. when he met me, I was a guitar player and a steel player. So I could kind of do what everybody did. And I sang, uh-huh. which Anders was the only singer out of them. So so I kind of got the gig, but the slide is really what sold it. So I play a lot of slide for Carl. Jesus so I, nice. I made the switch to a twin reverb to, to keep that like clean headroom. Yeah, I try to be a little clean. I don't, I'm not really one to... Fuzzy like even even my gain pedals, I use them with the volume all the way up to make the amp do the work instead of using them with the gain up high to uh-huh. saturate. Uh-huh. So I, I I made that switch to the twin, and every once in a while I do run another amp beside it when the twin can't hang. But mm-hmm. but yeah, I found that that worked for me compared to using two supers, which that's about the same wattage as one twin. So, just a little bit more solid sound. And then, yeah, yeah. So what what I'm doing with Carl is everywhere I go, there's backline, so I'm not using my own amp. Yeah. So it's twice the fee if I'm using two amps. Oh, really? So so I'm just using hmm. one amp for Carl's sake. I guess that. But makes they sense normally to have him. a. Yeah, you know, it's <laughs> nothing he asked me to do. Like Carl has yet to really tell me I can't do something. Yeah. So I mean I could probably bill him for two amps if I wanted, but it's it's working. DJ, the other guitar player, he's only using one amp and he's using a twin, mm-hmm. so we're even powered. When I joined the band, he was using a Marshall too, running oh, from yeah. the twin. So so it was kind of a bit much. Yeah, he was just too loud, and it was making me have to be too loud. And I said something. So we're both just using a twin, and it seems to be pretty balanced. Like when I hear us. On a video or something, are me and on, DJ, we're we're are you pretty on separate even. Sides of the stage, so we are. Okay. Yeah. Do you, yeah. The only do you listen he's to on him the far the left? No, I don't. I can hear him enough okay. with without any monitor. Mm-hmm. I'm like a lot of guys in the band. They like uh, like a CD mix in their monitor. Yeah. That's what they're going for. I don't know if they even know it or not, but they are. Uh-huh. But to me, I'm I'm trying to hear the stage. I don't I don't put nothing but my voice in my monitor. Oh yeah. And uh, <laughs> if I can't hear somebody at all, I might put enough of them in my monitor to hear them. But but I try to avoid like bands that put everything in their monitor. They're hearing the wrong shit to me. Yeah. They're like they have a whole other sound going on stage, and the audience is even hearing it as well. So they don't even know what the audience is hearing because they're hearing a whole nother mix on stage. Yeah. So it's, so I try to different. stay out of the rays of everyone's monitors and I try to actually hear the stage because that determines my dynamics and what I'm playing. Because yeah. I am that guy in the band. I'm the uh, I'm the dynamic dude. It's definitely a different you know, vibe. I intensify things. If it's intense, I make it more intense. And if it's haunting and scary i make it haunting and scary if it's you know whatever the vibe is i'm like the amplifier of that Uh so i try to listen to what's going on and not myself so much Mm -hmm. to help me with that role now um you talk about online presence and things like that where can people go online to find out you know where's seth freeman going to be where's seth freeman band Who's he playing with? You know, where do they go to find out that information? Well, at this particular time, I'm so busy touring with Carl that I'm my own webmaster. So my website is kind of out of date. I need to try to figure out a way to handle that. I stopped traveling with a laptop is what happened. And my oh, phone okay. isn't doesn't work. So, But there's SethFreemanBand.com. That's mm-hmm. my personal site. Okay. <laughs> and once I get out touring with my own stuff in a few weeks, I will be on that and it will be updated and current. So no and then, no reverb nation pages or anything like well, that. Well, I have reverb nation. All that shit is so like just past due for an update that oh, it's yeah. sad. But it's simply because I've been playing for Tiny Universe. Yeah. And I'm so busy, and I'm not traveling with a laptop, and on and on, all these excuses. 
But okay. nonetheless, the place to find Tiny Universe's stuff is carlbenson.us. Okay. That's where you can find Carl's tour schedule. We're playing this month, and then we're off for a while. He plays for the Rolling Stones, too, so he's going out with them. Mm-hmm. They have a extensive Europe tour, as well as rehearsals before the tour. So oh, we're yeah. about to be off for a bit, so I'm about to get back to my own thing. So hopefully soon, by the time somebody checks out these sites, they will be updated. Yeah, I'll make sure I include that in the show notes because I'll, you know, when I upload this, I'll put the links up there so anybody yeah, listening so can kind of click click over. As far as something that you can find is, uh, I'm on Facebook, of course. I got Seth Freeman Band page, and then I have my own personal Seth Freeman page, which is under my whole name, Jensen Seth Sebastian Freeman. Oh, really? And okay. it's uh, so that's the best way to kind of keep up with me because. I can keep up with that for my cell phone, and I do. Yeah. And other people that follow me and that come to my shows, they post things of me, which also helps me keep up with me or whatever, however you say that. Oh, yeah. But uh, as far as my music, that acoustic album. That's on and iTunes, right? My my last album. Yeah, I released them at the same time mm. in 13. So they're on iTunes. It's on amazon i think it's on uh cd baby it's on spotify radio and it's on and on and on so it's up to be listened to it's actually on youtube is where like if i got a a musician that i've hired that don't know my music i'll sit with them and show them my album on youtube mm-hmm. so i'm pretty sure i'm the only one even playing my album on youtube it's just <laughs> me playing it to my musician so they can learn it oh yeah so I don't really promote it or whatever. So I have this problem. I might as well tell you about it and so everyone knows. But uh, there's another Seth Freeman. And uh, mm-hmm. we are like night and day, uh-huh. total different in every possible way. But we both are Seth Freeman. And we both have blonde hair and uh, I didn't know that similar build and stuff. But he's more like... I don't know. I don't. Even, I don't want to bash him or or not say his genre right. But we're definitely different. Uh-huh. But nonetheless, he has become a problem in my social media. Like he's always there, and it's so far now that my Spotify radio channel. If you pick my Spotify radio channel, it has his picture on it. Oh shoot! And. Uh, that causes if you a bit shuffle of a my songs, yeah, if yeah. you shuffle my songs, like, within five or six songs, one of his will come on. So this, it's forever, I kind of ignored it, and I even reached out to him and was like, hey, man, you know, this is going on, and he was, like, not bothered by it at all, like <laughs> I was. Uh-huh. So he actually wanted to jam and stuff, which I was cool. It was cool to find out that he was friendly, yeah. but at the same time, it didn't fix nothing. So now I'm actually dealing with it with an SEO specialist and mm-hmm. some people that are trying to help me figure out how to isolate us. Oh, yeah, because that, I mean, that can be a problem. The problem is, yeah. It, it, yeah, it definitely could be you, and it already listener. has been. <laughs> so uh, if but the thing something... is, like if some promoter, yeah. if some hardcore blues Nazi, I call him, promoter, was told about me, and looked me up and accidentally looked him up, he is not blues at yeah. all. So it would cost me a gig. Mm-hmm. So so now it's become a problem a few years ago. But the thing is, is like I said, this, when, when my Spotify has his picture on it, that's when I was like, oh, no. Huh. Oh, yeah. Because if they so listened like to a couple of your songs and then heard one of his, they'd be like, I don't understand what this guy's doing. Yeah. <laughs> no, he's, I mean, it's like, I thought he was a joke for a bit. But oh, yeah. I think he was writing like some kid songs or something. Uh. <laughs> it's kind of that's kind of yeah. when I yeah. thought that I understood it a little more. Uh-huh. And then and then he's kind of evolved and doing a little bit more serious stuff now. Mm-hmm. Although I haven't checked into it much. Only what pops up when I'm trying to deal with my own shit. Yeah. But even like if you get on YouTube and you play a Seth Freeman mix, he's in it. And I am in know, his, yeah. and it's it's become a problem, and it's actually become like a publishing problem. 
Mm-hmm. His publishing rights are on my shit, and now it's become like where business is bad. Yeah. So, so I'm currently trying to deal with this. So this is also reasons why I do not promote my social media because right now it's not ready for for traffic like that, you yeah. know. So in playing for Carl's band, I've just it's allowed me to kind of figure all this out. So I'm currently writing music planning on recording it, working on my social media mm-hmm. and trying to get us isolated. This is where I'm at in my career. Yeah. And, uh, I hope you and get then that in the future, worked out for sure. I mean, cause that, yeah, me too, man. Me that's, too. That's cause it's a big deal. Problem. It's a, it is, it is for sure. And then especially I was happy, you know, he was a fan and super friendly, but like mm-hmm. I, I reached out to him for help and I could tell that right off the bat, he was no help. Yeah. He wasn't bothered by any of it. If anything, he acted like he didn't mind and he liked being with me. So I was just yeah. He may get I just little, dropped it. A few I dropped more my hits case. Out there. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, but it's still. I mean, it's still your brand and still his brand. It can affect him just the way it does you. So I mean, exactly. you gotta you gotta protect that. Exactly. So that's where I'm at. Is actually like meeting the people now, hanging with Carl. I'm meeting powerful enough people and knowledgeable enough also to go about fixing things that are problems in my career in yeah. general. So so that's where I'm at. I'm actually building a team on stage and off, mm-hmm. building my new material, Good. recording, working on social sites and working on my personal websites and just trying to like blossom and take the next steps to hit it hard next year with my band yeah. and the holes that Cause Carl you've been has. after it for a while. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I fell into this rut of uh, playing music for a living, which was <laughs> most people dream of doing. Yeah. And it's, it's not that I was making a lot of money, but I, I was making a living mm-hmm. and it took all my time and it turned into like just getting in a car and driving across the country and setting up and playing a gig. And that's all I had time to do. And then, and then before I know it, 10 years passed and nothing handled, mm-hmm. you know? So that's the beauty of playing for Carl is I went up a tier in the music industry and see how things work as well as I'm not, my livelihood ain't depending on my band anymore. Mm-hmm. So it allowed me to, to give it a rest and to like, plan some next moves and fix some things that have always been a problem so that's kind of where i'm at and i'm a, a little impatient with it but mm-hmm. at the same time i'm working forward and yeah. figuring it out if you're moving forward it definitely come around for you for sure well i'm gonna go ahead and wrap it up here and um man i appreciate you giving me the time and um yeah man you know i have this out here you know probably this week and you know you share it on your social media i'll share it and you know, get the word out there, especially about the, you know, the other Seth Freeman guy, because it's a bit. Yeah, a lot man. Of people I have mean, probably heard some stuff and they're like, this doesn't sound like Seth. <laughs> well, I'm hoping that, you know, the people that know him and the people that know me, they, they, they know us well enough that if they hear five seconds of us, then yeah. they know who's who. But the problem is for people that are looking him up to book him, mm-hmm. if they're looking for a, a acoustic guy, which is what he's doing a lot. And they look up my loud electric guy, me, it's going to cost him a gig. Yeah. And so, so same thing. If, if they're looking for a blues guitar player and they look up a Southern LA acoustic solo guy, then they're going to look on, you know what I mean? Yeah. So it's not helping each other any. And then like, it was okay for a while, but the fact that there's pictures on each other's things and there's YouTube mixes mixing together. Mm-hmm. I mean, we're too different to be together yeah. and our names are the same. So then it's confusing mm-hmm. even more so. So, so I've ignored it for a while and, but it's, it's gotta be handled now. And it's, if, if he wants a future in, in, in the music industry too, he's going to have to figure it out as well. Yeah. Maybe if I can handle it, then it'll handle it for him. So maybe he'll benefit from me handling it. But I'm definitely I'm sure he will. looking to handle it. Yeah. And, man, congratulations on all the success. Thank you, man. Yeah, because, I mean. Thank you. It, that's, it's been cool. To, to me, it's I've been big getting time. to jam with my heroes, man. <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah. everybody that I looked up to and drove around listening to for the last decade, 
I get to call them a friend and a peer now, and they call me for gigs, or uh -huh. they text me and tell me hello, or yeah, like my posts out. online, or whatever, man. So it's it's been cool to just become friends with my heroes, mainly. And that's wrapping it up for episode six of the Mega Talks podcast. Check the show notes. You don't want to miss the links over there for Seth Freeman. Links to his Facebook page. Also links to his YouTube page. Follow along there and see what the future has. And if you're listening on iTunes right now, I want you to click on my podcast. Leave a review. Leave a rating there. Let me know what you think about the podcast. And I want you to be ready for episode 7. Coming to you soon. I'll catch you guys then.